Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I am so happy to be here with Laura Chapman from Vox Tape Studios. Now, I will say I met Laura through a mutual friend, and he the reason I met her is because he was like, you got to check out this girl's content online. She is so amazing with her content. And then I just read in her bio that she has over a million followers online. So we'll definitely be talking about her content and how that draws in so many people, because I know many of you can learn from that. But the thing is, her specialization is voice. We're going to talk about, you know, vocal technique and vocal, how to get over a vocal injury and all of that. So it's going to be a multifaceted episode, which is exciting. So let's start off, Laura, with just your background. You know, what is your background in music and singing? Um, how did you get into vocal technique? And um, then how did you start teaching students? Absolutely. Well, first, thank you so much for having me, Brie. I'm excited to be here. And yeah, so my story, well, I always did music. I remember like, I was telling the story to, to someone recently and it was like, yeah, you know, I was in the national karate team and I quit because I wanted to do more music. And they're like, wait, hold on. What? You quit being in like the national team to do music? Why would you do something like that? So music has been my big thing my entire life. But but it was always voice like I play piano and guitar and you know the recorder like everyone learns how to play the oh, recorder yes. in, in school yeah I did all that too but yeah so you know I, I grew up in Switzerland tiny tiny little country in Europe and uh we don't have that many like I never had like the chance to participate in a musical from school like we it's just like not really things we do like a band or yeah just like an orchestra, a musical, like anything like that. That was just like, not really a thing. I had to do everything outside of school. And that was always something that very much drew me to the U S because like, I just always saw like all these things on, on TV, like in those movies and everything. And I was like, Oh, I wish I could go to school in the U S and do all these cool things. It sounds so amazing. So after high school, I actually ended up moving to New York city and I studied uh, musical theater out of all things. I just studied musical theater and acting for film and TV for two years. And during that time, I learned like, oh, I don't love musical theater. <laughs> I, For me, it was like, oh, why not sing, act and dance at the same time? That sounds great. Not realizing that musical theater music was very different from pop music, very different. And the way you sing it also very different. And I didn't quite realize that because musical theater is just not really a thing. I mean, it is like it's coming more and more. But back when I was in Switzerland, you know, we had like the major musicals and that was it. And I was like, oh, those are fun. I can do that. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> learned a lot there, but realized musical theater wasn't my thing. And then I auditioned to, uh, you know, to go to the Berklee College of Music up in Boston. I did that. And as I, you know, was going to school there, I actually got signed to a manager in Nashville to, you know, record music, release music, go on tour, do all these things, uh, which was really cool. But as a naive young girl from Switzerland, you know, I was like, this is my big break. Yeah, that, that wasn't the case. But like, I, I learned a lot. <laughs> I learned a lot during that time. And, you know, to make money on the side, like, you know, I, I was playing gigs and they paid, but it was not like, I, it wasn't enough. So I started teaching voice lessons on the side and realized that I loved teaching so much more <laughs> than being the artist myself. Like, don't get me wrong. I love the recording. I love the performing. All of that stuff was great, but everything else, including social media, believe it or not, I hate it. I hated it. I was like, I, I don't know what to do. No, no, I don't like it. And I loved, loved, loved teaching other people how to sing. 
So, you know, I went through a whole identity crisis of like, oh my gosh, I wanted to be a singer my entire life. Why don't I want to do it now? Now that I'm doing it, why, why is it changing? What's going on? And then COVID hit. And that was the thing that allowed me to transition um, into coaching full time rather than just doing it, it as a part. It's like game. it gave you permission to do the thing that you actually wanted to do. Yeah. Wait, isn't that crazy? That is crazy. Yeah. For a year and a half, I had like this internal battle of like, no, people are going to look at this as like, I'm quitting because I couldn't make it and blah, 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 blah. Right. And I was so concerned with what other people were going to think about this switch that I pushed my own desires um, and my own wants in the background. And, and I think COVID. some of it is that, you know, that whole like those who can't do teach, you know, that whole like, oh, you yeah. failed at it. So now you become a teacher. And that's so frustrating to me. Yes. Oh, I agree. I 100% agree. I truly believe you can only really be a good teacher if you really understand what's happening. And so, yeah, it's like to, for me, it's like kind of the opposite. Is it like a teacher should be someone who's like really figured it out, you know, mm. and knows how <laughs> so, to explain it to others. That's the other thing. Yes, right? yes, 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 yes. 100%. Because just because you can do something doesn't mean you can teach it and explain it. Right. That's right. Yeah. So when you yeah. during COVID, you really started building up your studio. And uh, yes. and now how big is your studio? Uh, I currently have four coaches that help me with the student load. And um, so I mean, I'm still teaching, but all the continuous lessons, all of um, my coaches are, are taking care of that. They're amazing. And um, yeah, it's it's been a it's been a wild journey, for sure. And it's all thanks to social media. <laughs> And, uh, you know, as a, as an artist, I was like, I hate social media. I don't know what to talk about. And then again, like I was doing the thing that I really wanted to do. So it became easy for me to create content for social media because I could talk about it all day long. So. I, that is the key right there that you were fully aligned and you were talking about what you wanted to talk about. Yeah. Do you, do you think that part of it is that like you're taking the like the focus off of yourself and talking more about, you know, it's about the voice and the technique or it's, a you know, and obviously you're still yeah. in the videos, but somehow it's maybe not as much about like, look, look at me. Yeah, I definitely agree. And and a big mistake that I made as an artist trying to promote my music was my image my artist image and who I was or am did not align. So for me, my big thing as an artist, my artist name was Lumaine, um, because a lot of people always commented on my hair. And I was like, all right, how can I make my hair a part my identity as an artist? And I was like, all right, big curly hair, like a lion's mane, right? Lumaine. Yeah, I have very straight hair. Okay, this is very curly. Like, I, this, I don't usually have hair like this. <laughs> usually it's true. It I saw you the other day straight. and it was straight now that I think about oh, it. Oh, yes. Yes. Super straight. My hair is super straight. And my image was big curly hair. And my manager was all about like, let's make it mysterious. And you know, everything you do has got to be perfectly within this image and blah, 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 blah. And so it just, it didn't work because like I wasn't allowed to post selfies. And then I was like, all right, I don't know what to post about. <laughs> If I can't post selfies. And then also like I had to have this huge head of hair every time I wanted to shoot a piece of content. And that was a big process and it didn't allow for spontaneity. Spon spontaneity. Yeah, you got it. Spontaneity. Thank you. <laughs> Being spontaneous. <laughs> it didn't allow for that. And yeah, it was just, it became a chore because everything needed to be perfectly planned. And mm. I'm, I'm not a planner. <laughs> No, I get that. So, and it's like, yeah. I mean, it's hard enough that we, you know, maybe want to like have our hair looking good and we're in the right outfit mm -hmm. and having maybe some makeup on or whatever, but you had to like totally transform in order to make any content. Yeah. And it just, it wasn't working at all. Yeah. That's a big deal. And now I love social media. <laughs> I mean, right. I mean, as much as I can, I always have like a little love hate relationship with social media. You know, every so often I'm like, I, don't I get it. Do this. I mean, we talked about <laughs> we talked about how you have to kind of have to have a pile of content, you know, create a big bunch of content at once. Yeah. And, you know, then it's like, oh, I'm good for a while. But then, oh, no, it's dwindling or whatever. And, you know, try to get some that's evergreen. Like that's a yeah. struggle that every artist goes through. 
But I'm curious, like what, like, how do you come up with your ideas for social media? Is it just totally off the cuff? Is it like on a daily thing? Or do you kind of do you write out some ideas and then just do a whole bunch of shooting? Or what do you do? It really depends. But I do m most of what I do is bulk recording. So I do think of a couple things and, you know, like in lessons, I have uh, like a little sheet that I have. And I start like, like whenever there's something that comes up in a lesson that I'm like, oh, this would be a good piece of content. Like I need to talk about this. I just add a quick little note to that sheet so that whenever it is shoot day, like content creation day, I can just go for, off of that list and just start talking about it. Right. Like I don't write scripts. Um, I just go off of the, the note and just be like, oh, okay. Yes. I need to talk about this for 30, 45, 60 seconds. Let's go. <laughs> Make it really short. Yeah. And most of us, we can talk off the cuff, especially if we're talking about something either we know really well or about ourselves. Yeah. You know, it's pretty easy yes. to talk off the cuff as long as you have something to spark the ideas. And I think, you know, this is something I've been trying to drill into artists that I work with is like, you've got to have a system for capturing that stuff. If you're on a walk and an idea comes to you, you're not going to remember it by the time you get home. You've got to no. put it, stop, put it in your phone notes or how However, you keep track of those kinds of things and make sure that you've got like a running list. So when it's mm -hmm. content day, you're not like, oh, I got nothing. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. And it's also a lot of it is like trial and error. Like I remember the first couple things that I posted, like I was like, oh, my God, what was I thinking? <laughs> You know, like a wrong format, you know, like it was a horizontal video instead of a vertical. And so like I just had a bunch of black space, like, you know, just like really bad. <laughs> <laughs> just bad. And so, you know, like you, you just start by posting and you learn as you go. And recently I've been posting a bunch of stuff that I was like, all right, this is what I wanted to post, but it's really not resonating with my mm -hmm. audience. So I'm going to go back to doing the things that I know work. And so today is actually shoot day for me, content creation day. And so, you know, I'm like, all right, um, I know my audience loves my pop song exercises where I take a pop song and I make a vocal exercise out of it. All right, let's go back to doing that. And I created 10 of those and now I'm filming them. And, you know, it's all like, obviously do what you want to do, but also listen to the feedback that you're getting from your audience as well and, and uh, make adjustments accordingly. For sure. I know you've had a few that have gone viral, maybe more than a few. Are, are those, yeah. are those the pop song exercises or are there some other types of content that you found are go viral? Every time, every time a video goes viral, it's a pop song exercise, <laughs> but not every pop song exercise goes viral, right. right? It's not like a foolproof thing. Like once you have a, something that goes viral, you're like, oh, I'll just recreate this and it'll go viral. Every like, No, I have some that perform really poorly and I don't know why, or they perform really well on one platform, but not on another. And it's like, why? This makes no sense. That's so, the thing like, for sure. I find that there are ones and it's almost always the same. Like it, it, if it does really well on Instagram, it doesn't do well on TikTok and vice versa. I, there's hardly mm -hmm. ever a thing that does well on both. Yeah. And it, it's, it's just, it's very interesting. And so, you know, like uh, there's some people like ask me like, all right, like, tell me like, what's your strategy and what do I like? And I'm like, I don't really have one. <laughs> <laughs> I just go with the flow, right? They're like, okay, how many hashtags? Right. And like, uh -huh. and I'm like, no, I, I really like, I don't listen to these gurus out there that are like, you got to do this, 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 and that exactly this way. And you're going to go like, no, it's just, I wish there was a formula or like a step-by-step -step process that we could follow, but there just isn't. I think the, the best thing you can do is start posting, learn from it, acquire feedback <laughs> essentially, and then adjust accordingly. Right. Yeah. So no, I mean, just gathering data. That's really the best way to go for sure. And everybody's data is different. Yes. 100%. Awesome. Okay. So we talked about the social media. I definitely want to get into yeah. the vocal <laughs> technique because that is your specialization. Yes. So I remember when I was taking lessons, and, you know, there's kind of sometimes this disconnect from how something sounds versus how it feels like it Ooh. may you may feel like it sounds amazing, but then, oh my gosh, this is, I feel like this is hurting my throat or vice versa. It may yeah. sound, I remember when I went through this phase where I was trying to, you know, uh, develop my break and all that stuff. And she's like, oh, just, just don't care how it sounds. It can sound super breathy, whatever, just do, mm -hmm. you know, do the technique this way. And eventually you'll build it up. And I'm like, oh, it sounds terrible. I can't stand it. I didn't want to do it, you know? Yeah. So how do you, how do you help singers kind of distinguish that and, and kind of feel comfortable with maybe it, it doesn't sound 
sound quite right yet, but it's the right feeling and you'll develop it. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely a whole lot of trust the process Mm -hmm. (laughs) that goes on in singing lessons, right? Like we have, we make weird sounds sometimes where it's like, what on earth is happening? How could this possibly help me to get to the result that I'm looking for? And so I use this technique called overcorrection, where like, let's say, you know, your, your singing sounds very like overly compressed, like it doesn't feel good. It's very pushy and strainy. That usually means, all right, there's too much compression going on in your vocal folds, right? And just so like your audience knows what this sounds like, it would be something like a, hey, right? It's, ah, it's very much like, oh my gosh, we're really pushing here. So uh, basically we just uh, need to go from an overly compressed sound to the opposite of that. Now, what is the opposite of an overly compressed sound? It's a very breathy sound, right? So it's, hey, hey. So we practice that for a little bit until we reach the tone that we want to achieve, which is like, you know, a, a well-balanced sound, which it would be something like, hey. Use this overcorrection technique a lot because it helps you get to the results very quickly. But as a base, um, uh, it, it's so important that singing feels good, right? Like, I don't care if you're making a, a sound that you're like, oh my gosh, this sounds incredible. I love it. Everybody else out there loves it too, but it feels terrible. I'm sorry. We can get to that sound in a sustainable way, in mm. a way that feels good too, right? I don't want you to compromise your sustainability, your vocal health, all of that, just to get to a specific tone. It's not worth it. Trust me. Yeah, I went I that, think down that think, rabbit hole. <laughs> I think people think if you're belting, you know, or you're growling or whatever, you have to hurt yourself mm. to make that sound. No. And I think this is, this is one of the biggest industry lies out there. Singing is hard, right? Mm. Like, and that makes you feel like, all right, if I'm working hard, that's when I know I'm doing it right. And it's, actually exactly the opposite. When singing feels effortless and easy and like you're not really doing anything, that's when you know you're doing it right, right? Mm -hmm. That's when it feels natural and flowy and easy. And it's just, it just flows out of your mouth. And it's like, oh my gosh, how did I just do this? This is incredible. That's when you know you're doing it right. That's when it becomes sustainable. And that's when it becomes like healthy technique, whatever it is you want to call it, right? For me, it's more like the the sustainability aspect of it. Like I want you to be able to get on stage night after night after night after night and do your thing and nail it every time and not get tired from it. Obviously, there's always limits to the voice. At the end of the day, it's muscles that we're training and that we're using. And just like any other muscle in your body, it has limits. You can only do so much, right? You can definitely overuse your voice. And still end up with a vocal injury, (laughs) even if you have perfect vocal technique, but still, right? Like we want to make sure that everything you do feels good. And once it feels good, we can tweak it to make it sound the way you want it to sound. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other struggle, and I've, I've talked with other singing teachers on this show about this because I was classically trained and I feel like the danger with being classically trained is it trains all the uniqueness out of your voice. And yeah, Mm. I I have great great technique, right? But it changed, you know, it it can make my voice sound like everybody else. So I know you work specifically on pop singing. How do you help people keep that uniqueness or even amplify that uniqueness in their voice? Oh, I love that you just said amplify because that is my job, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? Like my job is not to help you sound perfect because perfect is boring in contemporary singing. Okay. No shade on classical singing. (laughs) It's very different style of singing, very different style of singing. And also like I have, haven't had a day of classical training under my belt. Like Mm. not a single lesson was classical training. So you don't need to do classical voice lessons to sing pop. Like it's not going to help you. (laughs) It's not do pop training to sing pop or country or rock, like contemporary music in general. Right. So how do we do that? Well, my job is to listen for those natural imperfections that you have in your voice, right? And because that's the, the the things that make you stand out, the style, that's where the style comes from. It's, it's the imperfections that you have in your voice and then figure out, all right, how can we do those more and kind of like develop your, your style that way, like your signature sound, your radio effect, whatever it is you want to call it, uh, without sacrificing technique, right? Like we work on technique that helps you amplify those things so that you can do them more often and more easily and also yeah. explore other things, right? Like it depends on what uh, kind of singer I'm working with. If I'm working with more of a beginner um, and they, 
you know, like we need to work on the fundamentals of singing first. Uh, and then, you know, we, we look at all these different embellishments that, um, or, or like different kinds of tones that people can create and say, okay, what do you like? What do you not like? Mm -hmm. And then like, you know, work on those techniques so that you can do it in your voice and then see, okay, do you like it in your voice? Yes or no? Because just because you like it on somebody else doesn't mean you like it in your voice. <laughs> yeah. And I think that would really help someone that was new, like that maybe they don't know what their uniquely interesting parts of their voice are and stuff to kind of just try those things. I'm curious what you think about this. Like I listen to a lot of music when I'm, um, you know, picking music for women of substance. And so I hear plenty of people that have like interesting, unique sounds to their voice, but they don't fully sing in tune. And for me, that is very painful. Do, do you ever experience that where it's like, but I can't like if I actually sing perfectly in tune, I'm going to lose like the uniqueness of my voice or something. Yeah. So it's interesting because I literally just recorded a pitch accuracy exercise. Uh. <laughs> uh, pitch accuracy is obviously very important. Right. Like in the studio, yes, we have auto tune. We can use those things. There's no shame in using auto tune. I'm a big fan of it. I use it myself. Okay. <laughs> There's no shame in using it. But when you're singing live, you don't have that. You need to be able to sing on pitch. So on one hand, I always say it, singing is not just about hitting the right notes at the right time and sounding good. Singing is so much more than that. But at the same time, if you're not singing the right notes at the right time and you don't sound good, none of the other stuff matters. So that's the fundamentals, right? Like we need to make sure that the pitch is there. Nothing else matters. Like if, if you can't sing on pitch, you can have the most beautiful tone. You can have the most interesting voice. It doesn't matter. No one can listen to it because it's not right. Right. That the notes aren't there. So, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I think that more pe other people can put up with it more than I can, because I hear people, you know, I love this artist. And then like I hear them live and I'm like, oh, you know, they're not in tune. Yeah. And I guess a lot of people that maybe aren't musically trained like me can be it like okay sure. with that or doesn't bother them but for me yeah really there's definitely a certain level to that and also like fandom comes into place right mm -hmm. like if we go into like if you go to a concert and we paid money to be there like you're obviously a fan right and so you just you're there for the experience and if you're not a trained musician like some things just you, you don't notice like mm -hmm. you and I would right but but still like you know it, it's impossible to sing 100 percent accurately every single time like it's it's impossible there yeah. is always error there but we want to shoot for like 90 95 percent of the time um the pitch needs to be there and so yeah even with tools like autotune we got to make sure the pitch is there yep yep absolutely so i know you mentioned earlier about you know you can even have the best technique and still injure your voice and i know that you yes. went through that so do you want to like let us know just a little bit about your voice injury journey sure thing well <laughs> my injury didn't come from perfect technique but overusing my voice my injury came from technique, okay? <laughs> like I did not have good technique, even though I was taking lessons for like 12, 13, 14 years, something like that before I had my injury. Wow. Uh, and yeah, it was. it's actually fascinating. Like the more I talk about it, the more I'm like, how did none of the 15 plus vocal coaches that I was working with ever tell me to just stop because I was going to end up in this situation. Like not a single one, not even the professors at Berkeley, mm. <laughs> you know, like not a one listened to me and was like, Hey, I hear what you're doing. And I promise you're going to end up in this situation in a couple of years, sooner or later. Right. I'm fascinated. No one told me, but anyways, so I was a yeller, a screamer. Mm. I was yelling on pitch, essentially, right? Like I didn't care what it took to hit that high belt note. I was going to get it no matter what, oh right? God. And so I was like, oh yeah, I'm increasing my range. I'm stretching my range. Like, no, I'm just pushing. I'm literally just pushing and do that for a couple of years. And when you're young, your voice bounces back. And the older I got, and I mean, I'm still young. I'm still only 28. And when I had the injury, like that was just a couple of years ago, right? Right. Like I'm pretty young and um, these injuries happen, but you know, it's um, the more you do it, the less your voice bounces back. And so the longer this went on, you know, I, I would lose my voice for a day and then I would lose my voice for two days, but it would always come back until eventually it wouldn't. And so uh, there was this one time where it was February. Oh my gosh. And my voice didn't come back for weeks. Like I couldn't even speak like speak. 
speaking would hurt. Wow. And that's when I was like, all right, I, I really messed it up this time. So I went to go see a laryngologist and I had vocal pre nodules. So those were basically just really small nodules. And, you know, obviously that was the worst news I ever got. <laughs> ever. So I was panicking, but my laryngologist said like, it's okay. You're just going to have to do some speech therapy and you're going to have to change the way you sing because girl is not working. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're going to end up in this situation over and over and over again, if you don't change things. And so that to me where was where it was like, okay, I really need to make changes to this. And I need to prioritize releasing tension, making singing feel good. And so, you know, together with the uh, speech therapy and all this other stuff that I did, I was able to get back to, you know, the skill level where I was at within just a couple months, maybe three months um, of having the diagnosis went back to normal within three months and then exceeded my vocal skills and, you know, just improved mm. and got better and better and better from there on out. And I can now sing better than I could before. And it feels better than ever before. And I'm not having any vocal issues. Like I'm not getting tired. I'm not having any sort of vocal injuries or anything like that. Just because I started prioritizing what singing felt like rather than what it sounded like. It really mm. comes down to that. That's that's great to hear that you can recover like that. Do you feel like yeah. with your students, can you see or hear if they're going down that kind of path? Can you actually see that tension in them oh, yeah. or hear it in their voice? Oh, immediately. And mm -hmm. especially if it's someone who's as bad as me at it, <laughs> like who's just literally yelling on pitch, right? Like, especially if it's like this prominent in their voice, then I'm mm -hmm. like, yeah, I'm like, okay, you're going to hate me for the next couple months but you're going to love me after because I'm the medicine you don't want to take, but I'm the medicine that's going to help you get better. You have to do this or it's not going to end well. But yeah, in, in most cases, um, tension is there, but not as badly as mm -hmm. me. I'm a very, I was a very extreme example, but yeah, I would say tension is something that I work on in about 90% of first time lessons. So when someone meets with me for the first time in a very first lesson, releasing tension is most likely going to be something we do, but it looks different in every singer mm. releasing tension, right? It shows up differently for everyone. And if they've been, you know, using a lot of tension, yelling on pitch, belting, that kind of thing, and then you're trying to get them not to do that and release the tension, do they immediately feel like, oh, my, now my voice is weak. My voice sucks. <laughs> no, no. That's because great. we release tension in a way where we don't have to sacrifice power. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And that's what it's all about. Like, I don't, I don't want you to go from Demi Lovato to Billie Eilish just because it's better for your voice because well it's not. and i kind of thought maybe you'd have to <laughs> you'd have to go there and then you could build it back up uh i mean sometimes and sure like maybe for a week or two or sometimes even a month like it, it really depends on the singer and you know how bad the tension is mm. but in most cases um it's like we do two or three exercises in that lesson and then we bring the power back in and you already feel a difference like and it the power is there and it already feels better it might not be the end result that we're going for it's going to take a couple more tweaks than just one lesson, but we can absolutely already get to like, okay, this is what we're going for. And it feels much better. And it still sounds good. And it still sounds powerful. That's awesome. Well, we have a lot, we have all different types of musicians that watch the show, listen to the show. Um, we do have a lot of singer songwriters, I'd say, and I'd say many of them maybe haven't had a voice lesson or, you know, didn't think they needed one, or they were focused on, you know, just singing their own songs the way that they sing and that kind of thing. But what do you, what can you say to them about how maybe just even taking voice lessons for three months, how it can change and improve what they already have. Well, you don't know what you don't know, mm. right? And so currently, you know, you you might just be, you know, singing the songs like you always have, and it probably sounds good, right? And we love a good natural talent. Congratulations. Very <laughs> few people have it, <laughs> right? Um, but there's, oh my gosh, like there's a whole universe out there to explore. Like there's so much you could be doing with your voice. And it goes beyond just like the do a vocal fry here and do a riff there and add some vibrato. Like there's so much that goes into it. And when, when we start exploring together, like the releasing tension part, right? Like your range increases, your vibrato gets better, your, you can riff faster. Like that's a part of it. But the other part of it is 
you know, just like exploring your voice, different tones, different embellishments and seeing like, how can we put together a full, a full picture for you? Right. Like, especially if you feel like, yeah, everything's kind of start sounding the same. Like if you feel like that, please dear Lord book a session, whether it's with me or somebody else out there, please book a session because there's so much that you could be doing. Like if you, if you listen to Adele, for example, if you listen to her sing and you really dissect every single phrase that she sings, it's like, oh my God, there's so many different things that she's doing to pull us in and really take the experience to the next level. And I feel like that's every singer's job. Like if you're a professional singer, why don't you have a coach? Like, have you met a professional football player who doesn't have a coach? Yeah. And I think why would it be different for singers? That Adele example, it's like, she's got all these tools and, and, and I think we tend to think, well, oh, that's just all natural. That's just what happens when she opens her mouth. No, she has learned all these tools. She knows where to use them, you know, and then some of it becomes totally uh, subconscious, right? But then some of it is like, yeah, I think maybe it would be better if I did that, you know, I pulled back here instead of, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, no, 100%. And again, it, it goes back to you don't know what you don't know, right? Like you've been singing the same way for such a long time. Like, what if you had like somebody else out there who's like, guiding you a little bit and and like exploring things with you, right? And even if you don't like, like one of the examples, you're like, actually, I don't like that. I'm like, all right, cool. Let's not do that. Then let's do something else, right? It very rarely happens, but I'm, you know, like it's not, it's not on me to, to tell you what you should sound like and just be like, all right, this is going to be you. Like, no, it's, it's a collaboration and you take the lead. I'm just here to give you the tools to get you to where you want to be. Yeah. And I think everybody that's listening now, is probably excited. They're like, I want to, I want to jump in on that. So how can they (laughs) connect with you? How can they follow you on social media and also maybe book a, a lesson? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so my social media handle is at Vox Tape Studios. Uh, that's the name of my studio. I'm the founder of the studio. But yeah, I highly recommend that you check out some of our videos there. Um, we do have a free guide um, for, uh, it's called the, the Vocal Persona Quiz. So, you know, like I said, oh, it's going to be different for everybody. <laughs> and that's why like learning how to sing off of YouTube videos or social media videos in general is quite difficult because not everything applies to you. And if you don't already have a lot of experience, you don't don't know what applies to you and what doesn't apply. So if you've been feeling frustrated with, you know, your progress, you're not really seeing progress. It's probably because you're doing the wrong things for your voice. So I solved that problem with my quiz where you, you answer a couple questions and uh, it spits out your vocal persona for you. And no vocal persona and voice type is not the same thing, right? Like soprano, tenor, all of that. And vocal persona is not the same thing. So vocal persona helps you understand your voice better, your tendencies better as a singer. And then you, you, you get a personalized training uh, for your persona as well. So I highly recommend that you check out my my little quiz, my vocal persona quiz. The links are in all my on all my social media pages. Yeah, that's and that's where easy. you can book a session with me too. So <laughs> perfect. No, I yeah. love the quiz. It's it's great to go in with some knowledge about yourself before you book a session as well. So yes. that's super awesome. Thank you so much, Laura. This has been so good. I love hearing about kind of your creation process for social media as well as all of your knowledge about singing. Um, it's yeah. it's really it's really great to you know know that if we've got these tendencies in our singing, it's not something we can't deal with. If we have the right coach yes. that can help us to, oh you know, gosh. get our voice and keep it in shape. And, you know, here I am 52, like I'm still singing. I feel like I'm singing like I was when I was 30 because I'm mm. keeping my voice in shape, you know? Well, and Kelly Clarkson recently said in an interview, like she's 40 something and she's like, I'm a better singer now than I was mm. when I was 20. Mm. Right. So it's really like, if you feel like you're hitting a ceiling or you feel like something is not possible for you, because like, I hear this all the time, like, oh, how can I hit high notes? I'm an alto, like high notes probably are just not for me or vice versa. Like I can't sing low notes or I can't sing with power because I'm a soprano. I'm like, literally none of that matters. (laughs) You just need to have the right tools. And that's my job and my team's job, right? To, to give you the tools so that you feel like everything's possible because it is, it's just training. Very well said. Very well said. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. 
You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician. 